Open your Bibles, please, and turn with me to the book of Galatians, chapter 6. I'm going to start reading in verse 12, and I'm going to read through verse 16. Galatians, chapter 6, and verse 12. And I want to kind of take this a little bit slow so as we can digest what Paul is saying to the churches in Galatia in this passage. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. The entire book of Galatians is written to combat the influence of the Judaizers in the churches of Galatia. They had crept into the church and were a major thorn in the side of the truth, in the side of the gospel, and in the side of all true Christians in these early churches. They proposed that the cross of Christ was not enough that faith in Christ was not enough, that Christians needed to also adhere to the Old Testament doctrines of the law of Moses. And they had crept into the churches in great numbers and had influenced the churches to a great degree. So much so that Paul needed to write this letter to the churches of Galatia to correct this great wrong and to set these churches in order relative to this heresy that was threatening to take over the entire churches of Galatia. Now, I'm picking up in the latter part of the letter, of course, Chapter 6 being the last chapter, verses 12 and following being the last few verses of this letter. But Paul is addressing these Judaizers who are intimidating the church and who are trying to bring the Judaization of the churches into a reality through the pressure that they bring to bear upon the people. So Paul says, as many as desires to make a fair show in the flesh, they are trying to, through their own selfish, fleshly efforts, they are not being motivated by the Spirit of God, they're not motivated by the Spirit of love, the Spirit of grace, or the Spirit of the gospel. They are motivated by the spirit of the flesh. They are honoring the flesh. They are magnifying the flesh. They are serving the flesh. And through the flesh, they are trying to destroy the work of the spirit in the churches. They want to make a fair show in the flesh. They constrain you. They pressure you. They intimidate you. They use every mechanism possible to cause you to be circumcised because that was what God required of the Old Testament Jew. It was a mark of the Jew's relationship, Old Testament Israel, relationship with Jehovah God. None of the pagan countries of the world at that time circumcised their little male babies. God required that the Hebrew boys be circumcised as a sign of the relationship that Israel had with their creator, Jehovah God. If I can explain it to you this way, circumcision was to the Old Testament Jew what baptism is to the New Testament Christian. It was a sign of that relationship 
with God. And so that was an Old Testament requirement under the law of Moses for the children of Israel. Now these New Testament Jews are trying to coerce and convince their fellow believers, if indeed they were saved at all, that they needed to be circumcised according to the law of Moses. Faith in Christ was not enough. They needed to follow the law. They needed to follow Moses. They needed to be circumcised. And they did it with great force. They constrain you to be circumcised. But notice Paul said, their motive is not pure. They were not really doing this for the good of the people that were being circumcised. But Paul gives their motivation in the last clause of this verse. Lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. In other words, if they did not pursue the Old Testament doctrines of Moses within the church, they would be persecuted by the other Judaizers for their faith alone in the cross of Christ. You see, the devil doesn't mind if you believe in the cross. He really doesn't mind if you believe in Jesus as long as that is only part of what you believe. Jesus plus circumcision. Jesus plus the law of Moses. Jesus plus baptism. Jesus plus good works. Jesus plus church membership. Jesus plus speaking in tongues. Jesus plus living a good life. Jesus plus, 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 plus. The devil is very happy for you to believe in Jesus as long as you do not believe in Jesus alone. Alone. Jesus plus nothing. Nothing. No law. No works. No church. No priest. No gifts. Nothing. Jesus plus nothing. The devil hates. So they were trying to add to Christ. And the reason for that was the persecution that they would receive from the Judaizers in Galatia who refused to follow Jesus and Jesus only, who accepted Jesus and Jesus alone, who did not mix Jesus with the works of the law. And I am telling you, I mean, these, these charlatan preachers today are gifted beyond belief in the ability to hide the truth of what they are teaching. They present it in such flowery ways and many times such ambiguous ways. And they use so many good sounding biblical terms and phrases and half truths to convince people that they are real men of God, to convince people that they are giving people truth and they're not. When you listen carefully and if you know the truth yourself and that's where you gotta start If you don't know the truth yourself, then you're going to fall for any lie coming down the pike. But if you know the truth yourself and you listen carefully, you are going to hear them doing exactly what these Judaizers were doing in the churches of Galatia, mixing the gospel of Christ with a bunch of Old Testament law. 
And that is what Paul is correcting in this passage. You see, if you believe in Jesus and Jesus only, no law, no works, no circumcision, no baptism, no anything, you are going to be persecuted by the religious crowd vehemently. You wouldn't believe, well, you would, the letters I receive from so-called Christians, religious people, who despise the fact that I do not preach Jesus plus Old Testament works. Jesus plus Old Testament law. I'm telling you, my friends, you can write me all the letters you want. If you are not relying on Jesus' death and resurrection only for your salvation, your justification, your sanctification, your glorification, you need to be born again because you're not. Oh yeah, I'm a Christian and I'm keeping the law. No, you're not a Christian. Yeah, I'm a Christian, but I'm being baptized. I'm a Christian, but I'm doing good. I'm a Christian, but I, I'm, I'm being circumcised. I'm a Christian. No, 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 no. No, no, no. None of those things will save you. Jesus Christ alone will save you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He didn't say, but by me and baptism, but by me and the law, but by me and Moses, but by me and circumcision, but by me. We, are, we have re-entered a Judaized Christianity in America. We are where we were 2,000 years ago when Paul wrote the book of Galatians. Churches in mass have been duped by these works-oriented, Judaizing so-called Christians that are infecting the church with the poison of false doctrine and are trying to bring people back under the law of Moses. For neither they themselves who are circumcised, these Jewish proselyters, keep the law. Did you hear that? Neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. You're one of their disciples. Oh, look at that. He's one of my disciples. He's one of our disciples. We caused him to be circumcised. Wow, aren't we special? Everybody's always trying to claim another trophy through your baptism or through your circumcision or through your church membership or through your catechism or through your formality. Whatever is the prescription that they write out for you as making you acceptable for, to God. They want your signature on the bottom line so they can hold you up as one of their trophies in the flesh. Yeah. But Paul said, they that want you to obey the law, they, they, don't, they don't obey the law. And all these people that are talking about being saved by the law, they're, they're so full of it, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, I'm trying to be nice, but they're so full of it, it's unbelievable. I think it was 600 and whatever the number was, laws that God gave to Moses. Over 600. James, in his epistle, says that if you are guilty of breaking one law, you are guilty of breaking all of the law. 
None have obeyed the law save the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't keep the law. You are relying on a law that you cannot keep to save you. How foolish you are. And then you have the hypocrisy to try and coerce other people to keep a law that you yourself cannot keep. There's not a person under the sound of my voice that has kept or could keep the law of Moses. Not a one of you. Paul, the apostle, talked about that in Romans chapter 7. He talked about how ardently he was a, a student of the law and how hard he tried to keep it. And he went through the commands, just the Ten Commandments, not all 600 and some odd, but the Ten Commandments. And he said, when I got to that, that command that said, thou shalt not covet, sin revived and I died. And I realized, Saul of Tarsus, I had not kept the law of Moses. I had fallen short. Really? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you who have begun by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, are you now made perfect by the law of Moses? Ludicrous! We are made holy in Christ and in Him alone. Our righteousness is in Him. Our holiness is in Him. Our salvation is, him, is in Him. He kept the law of Moses perfectly. He fulfilled the law in himself. And when we become the sons of God and the sons of Abraham by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we kept the law through, Amen. through, not us, the Lord Jesus Christ. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom, the, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. We are crucified to worldly religion, to worldly things, to worldly philosophies, to worldly ideas, they are dead to me, Paul said. I'm crucified to the world. And make no mistake about it. Works, doctrines for salvation is just another religion of the world that is a false religion trying to deceive the minds and hearts of the simple from believing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are dead. We are dead to the world. We are dead to the world's religions. Paul said, I'm only glorying in Christ. I'm not glorying in the law of Moses. I'm not glorying in Judaism. I'm not glorying in the, the Judaizing so-called Christians. I'm not glorifying, I'm not, I'm not glorying in circumcision. I'm not glorying in the, in the ceremonies and the Sabbaths and the new moons of the, of the old religion. I'm not glorying in any of that. It's dead to me. I glory only in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're wondering about any of this, verses 15 and 16, Paul makes it very clear. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. It doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or whether you're not. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile. It avails nothing. 
it means nothing. The only thing that matters is that we are new creatures in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. That's the only thing that matters. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. You guys are talking about the Old Testament Israel. You're talking about the Mosaic Israel. You're talking about the Old Testament law. You're talking about the Mosaic law. That's not the Israel of God. The Israel of God is neither Jew nor Gentile. Bond or free. We are all one in Jesus Christ. That is the Israel of God. In this passage, we found the great spiritual battle between the Judaizers and the gospel, between the law of Moses and the law of Christ. One is the law of bondage and death. The other is the law of liberty and life. And believe it or not, America was founded on the law of liberty and life. It really was. But over the last century, modern day Judaizers, which is what they were referred to in the early church, now they are called Zionists, have reintroduced the law of bondage and death to our churches and our nation. And as a result, both our churches and our country are dying. The old law produces bondage and death. If you place yourself under that law of bondage and death, you will be enslaved and you will die. And if a church collectively put itself under that law, they will be enslaved and they will die. And if a nation puts itself under that law, they will be enslaved and they will die. And that's what is happening in our country today. It's not new. It's at least 100 years old. But every year it intensifies beyond what it was the year before. At the national level, let me skip to that just for a moment. At the national level, Christians need to wake up to the fact that the international banking interests that dominate our political and our financial entities are working tirelessly to see an end of nationhood, and that's one of the quotes from them. I'm talking about the Rothschilds and the Warburgs of Europe. I'm talking about the houses of J.P. Morgan, Kuhn, Loeb, Schiff, Lehman and Rockefeller, all Zionists. For all intents and purposes, the globalist agenda, the new world order, call it what you will, and the Zionist agenda are one and the same. There are millions of Christians around the country who claim to be awake to the New World Order, while at the same time they worship the doctrines of Zionism and the modern state of Israel. Such people 
have proven that they don't have the foggiest clue what the New World Order is all about. If you do not recognize the influence, dare I even say the control of the Zionist movement within the New World Order, you don't understand the New World Order whatsoever. And there are millions of Christians that think they are so smart about the New World Order and actually they know nothing about it because they do not understand the connection between the globalism, the New World Order, all, all these terms that they throw out, and Zionism. They are one and the same. Both Democrat and Republican presidential administrations, including the administration of Donald Trump, are littered with CFR globalists and Zionists. If Donald Trump is reelected to a second term, he will fill more positions in his administration with CFR globalists and Zionists than did Barack Obama and G.W. Bush before him. That is the pace he is currently on. Don't be fooled. This president is doing as much to fulfill the will of the Zionist globalist elite and the New World Order elite as any president before him, all of his rhetoric notwithstanding. Let me remind you of Rear Admiral Chester Ward, who was, of course, as you know, the Judge Advocate General of the Navy many years ago, said, quote, the main purpose of the Council on Foreign Relations is promoting the disarmament of U.S. sovereignty and national independence and submergence into an all-powerful one-world government, close quote. We keep a list on my webpage of the CFR and Bilderberg appointments that President Trump makes. And if you want to go online at any time, we try to keep it as current as we can when we find out about appointments. And you can see the list of the CFR and Bilderberg appointments that President Trump has made. And like I said, on a pace to surpass appointments of these radical Zionist globalists more than Obama and Bush. But it's really even worse than that. Because not only have the Zionists successfully infiltrated, and dare I say now, control our federal government, both parties, they have successfully distracted America's Christians and churches with a phony enemy. And that phony enemy is Islam. I preached a series of three messages a couple of years ago called The Muslim Problem. It's on the table, it's on the store, if you're watching online, where I deal with this subject in a little bit of detail. I would also recommend for your study Christopher Boleyn's tremendous book, The War on Terror, The Plot to Rule the Middle East essential reading to understand what I am now saying. If you have not watched those messages, if you've not read that book and others like it, and you hear me say what I just said, many would, they would recoil with unbelief. What? Islam is not our great enemy? No, it's really not. A book that we also carry is, Mike, is Michael Hoffman's 
fantastic book, banned by Amazon, but carried on ChuckBaldwinLive.com. <laughs> Judaism, Strange Gods. You haven't read that? Your education is lacking. Michael Hoffman wrote this uh, a couple years ago now, actually, maybe a year and a half. It's about two pages. Let me, let me read this. Michael Hoffman, the same one who wrote the book, Judaism, Strange Gods. He wrote this because every time we turn around, we're hearing these Christians hyperbolic, screaming and exclaiming, Sharia law is coming. Sharia's law is coming. We're fighting Sharia law. It's the Constitution or Sharia law. We've got to fight Sharia law. How many times have we heard this on Fox News? How many times have we heard this from these televangelist Christian Zionist preachers? How many times have we heard it in the pulpits across the country? And so because of that, that barrage of insanity, Michael Hoffman wrote this piece as a kind of a rebuttal. I want to read it for you. My bedtime reading is the Babylonian Talmud. It's true. I find horror literature relaxing. <laughs> I take a volume of the Talmud and a pencil and I sit on the edge of my bed and study for 20 or 30 minutes every night, secure in the thought that it will not be any time soon that I run out of material since the Talmud consists of more than 30 volumes, much of it turgid minutia about subjects so prurient that boggle the mind. The Sanhedrin volumes cover capital punishment and other forms of penal law, including the eerie concept of the Rodef pursuer. It is often bragged that the religion of the Talmud has suspended enforcement of the death penalty. Hence, Gentiles don't have to fear that worshipers of Jesus Christ will be executed for idolatry under the Noahide laws. I'll be talking more about that in the near future, but if you've not already studied the Noahide laws, you might want to do that. Noahide laws are a major political force today. Uh, the Congress and the, and the White House has made all kinds of official public tribute to the Noahide laws, saying that all Americans should submit to the Noahide laws and things of that nature, more and more, the Noahide laws are going to become the common law of the country under which America must submit. So when he talks about the Noahide laws, that's what he's talking about. One of the Noahide laws, it, it, it's, it talks about idolatry. And, and here's the thing about the, the Jewish definition of idolatry. If a Gentile even says the name of God, if a Gentile tries to pray to God or in the name of God, if a Gentile even tries to worship God, the Gentile has committed idolatry. And of course, it, under Noahide laws, Death is by beheading, execution by beheading. Now, I don't know, you can take this as you want, because right now it's just something that's out there without explanation. But it is a fact, you can look it up yourself, do your own research, that in the state of Georgia, our government has been amassing 
hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of guillotines. And they're just sitting there in storage in these huge warehouses, not doing anything with them. There's no, there, there's no reason given as to why they're there or what's the purpose, but there's only one thing guillotines are made for. You can figure that out without a whole lot of thought. Is that right? He's saying there's some in Hardin, Montana. So there may be in other cities around the country as well. The one, I, the, the, the big uh, compound that I know about that has them is, is located in Georgia. So he's writing, he's saying, Gentiles don't have to fear that worshipers of Jesus Christ will be executed for idolatry under the Noahide laws. Ha, ha, ha. That's the cover story. The truth is, while the rabbinic court, and he uses the Hebrew words, does not formally, and as a matter of public action, issue death penalties, they do permit the preemptive execution of a person designated a rodef or pursuer. Now, here's going to get really interesting, so don't lose your train of thought. We are dealing here with lawyers. Therefore, it is necessary to be cognizant of the myriad escape clauses that are native to the Talmudic gestalt. Nowadays, no rabbinic court sentences anyone to death. That's true. Hence, people are murdered without a trial. You check. Rabin, Israel Prime Minister, was the most notorious recent case of that. He was assassinated in 1995 by an Israeli name of Yigal Amar, or Amer, a Talmud student, because Rabin was earnestly endeavoring to make peace with the Palestinians. Amer invoked the rabbinic law governing a pursuer. Rabin was considered by the Israeli colonialist settler movement to be a rodif, a pursuer, and hence he was summarily murdered as a preventive act. As a preventive act. That word preventive should ring a lot of bells in your mind. A preventive act. This is a feature of the Talmudic law governing the pursuer. It was conveyed to George W. Bush that the nation of Iraq under Saddam Hussein was a pursuer. And a first strike aggressive war was launched in accordance with the Talmud. While Protestant fundamentalists and papalist neocons ran about screeching, beware, Sharia law is nearly here. Sharia law is nearly here. Are you getting that? George W. Bush, President of the United States, launched two invasive wars against two sovereign foreign countries based on and according to Talmudic law. Pursuers come in all shapes and sizes, back to Michael Hoffman. They can even be Judaic children. In 1973, Americans were shocked and deeply, deeply disturbed when the Supreme Court not only legalized abortion at 12 or 16 weeks gestation, the court, in conformity with the Talmud, legalized abortion on demand at any time during the pregnancy, including a few minutes before the baby is born. This abominable crime against the innocent is permissible in those lands where the Talmud exerts dominion, including Israel, the state of Israel. 
the 1973 Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision was done under the authority and the auspices of the Talmud. Two wars under the authority of the Talmud. How many babies have been killed since 1973? Over 60 million at least. How many people have been killed in these phony wars for Israel in the Middle East since World War II? Best estimates, at least two million. Under Talmudic law. Not Sharia. Talmudic law. Back to Hoffman. The, rev the, the relevant halakha is found in the uncensored text of the Talmud Babylon in Sanhedrin 72b, where a mother believes her unborn baby is endangering her life by pursuing her. According to the Talmud, this unborn infant rodif can be eliminated at any time during the pregnancy except when the mother is actually giving birth and the head of the child becomes visible. Before the baby is born, this is a quote from the Talmud, it is not considered a living soul and it is therefore not subject to the law of murder, close quote. Right-wing campaigners, Hoffman continues, against the alleged imminent imposition of Sharia law, announce that they are defending the Constitution against Islam. We have never seen a case where Islamic law profoundly influenced members of the Supreme Court. We have, however, observed repeated Talmudic influence over how the court interprets the Constitution in the modern era. Roe v. Wade is one example. Another is the discovery, quote, of a constitutional right to legalize the marriage of sodomites. It goes without saying that the founders envisioned no such right, just as the Bible made no allowance for a usurping Talmud. You do realize, do you not, I'm talking myself here now, that the state of Israel is the headquarters of the homosexual movement and the abortion movement worldwide. You understand that, do you not? Tel Aviv in particular. Tel Aviv is the sodomite and abortion capital of the world. The Talmudists have influenced and manipulated our Supreme Court for decades. Have manipulated and influenced the executive branch of government, including in the waging of war, for decades. Have influenced and manipulated the Congress of the United States in making laws for decades. And Christians are worried about Sharia law. Are you kidding? A couple more sentences and we'll be done with Michael Hoffman. In the religion that is directed by the Talmud, there is no legislature. All laws are made by judicial decision. It just so happens that this is how much of the supreme law of the land is made in America. Another name for activist judge is Talmudic judge. You hear all these court decisions making law. They're not interpreting law. They're creating law. That's the doctrine of the Talmudic adherence. They don't believe in legislatures. They believe in the judiciary being all-powerful. There's reams of books out in the book world if you look for them talking about the judicial supremacy doctrines and the tyranny of the bench and things of that nature that you can read but hardly any of those authors make the connection between the tyranny of the 
benches of the courts of America with the Talmudists that are manipulating and influencing those American courts. Until you identify the source of the problem, you're never going to solve the problem. Hoffman concludes, our nation is under Talmudic law, not Sharia. Though immense troops of Protestant and Catholic ignoramuses display their cluelessness as they crusade with intense fervor against a non-existent menace, while oblivious to the cancer eating at the bowels of our nation. Hear, hear, Michael Hoffman. America is being conquered from within. If you have not watched my three-part series, Hell's Greatest Hoaxes on America, it's on the table, you can get it on the store. I go into those great deceptions that the devil has made against America and how America has fallen for those deceptions. Hook, line, and sinker. Hell's greatest hoaxes on America were being conquered internally. The IRS is conquering our churches. Fear is conquering our pastors. Greed and the lust for power have conquered or are conquering our political leaders. Humanistic education is conquering our children's minds. Amoral movies, television, and entertainment is conquering our teenagers. Fox News is conquering our senior citizens. And Zionism has conquered or is conquering most of Western Christendom, mainly through the false Israel-based dispensational eschatology, which I will be addressing at length in the weeks and months to come. And at this point, I have to read this letter that I received this week. To be honest with you, I was taken aback by this letter. It's difficult to even digest. And at this point, I'm not even sure what I'm supposed to do. I wrote this man back and told him I was praying much about his letter. That's all I knew to say. I've never received a letter like this. His name is Robert. Hello, Chuck. I just heard about you last night for the very first time. While watching you appear as a guest on the Adam Green Show, apparently it was broadcast a few days ago. I wish to extend to you my most heartwarming fellow Christian congratulations in waking up to the truth about what I call satanic Israel, which has been so deceitfully and deceptively hidden from the mainstream Christian America. I found myself recently becoming quite depressed with the shocking and very demoralizing realization that my so-called elected U.S. representatives are really not much more than agents of the foreign country of Israel and that I couldn't not count on any help from them. And at that point he went into a rather long personal history of his journey in his philosophical understanding and the political involvement he was in and how that he had put his trust in the, the political process to change things and conservative politicians to change things. He goes into quite 
a length of explanation, which I will skip over. That's what he said, I've become quite depressed by realizing I couldn't count on the congressman to change anything. Then I saw you on the Adam Green show, and my whole outlook changed. It will be Christianity, not the politicians, who will remove us from this dark black hole of Talmudic Zionism and into truth and light. It will be Christianity, not the politicians. What have I been saying all these years? But he goes on. I call upon you, Chuck Baldwin, to lead our way. This is your true heavenly calling. We must mount an international, not just American, but an international Christian emergent call to arms, not with guns, but with knowledge and truth. Because as Adam very correctly but very frighteningly warned, time is running out very quickly. So on behalf of your fellow American Christians who love what is still left of our once beautiful America. Would you take charge in leading a major coordinated effort to finally bring the truth to our beleaguered brainwashed fellow Christians because after studying the Israel issue for 13 years, I'm firmly convinced the politicians are a long lost cause and it's up to us Christians to save America and to save ourselves. I can only hope, though, that it's not too late. Chuck, please lead us. I truly don't know what to do with that letter. My mind, when I read it, went into an, an immediate carousel of thought. And quite frankly, I have no idea how to even begin to do what this gentleman is asking that we do. Yes, I, I know we are. But can you sense the weight yes. of burden and opportunity that God may have brought us to the kingdom for? I don't think... I know yet what that means. I don't think any of us can know yet what that means. But I want you to know that I have not forgotten this letter for more than a few moments at a time since I read it. And I'm praying incessantly for God to show me how we can answer that letter and how we can do and be perhaps what God has brought us to this place for. I don't know of another group of people in the entire world outside of the people that I'm looking at in this room and the people that watch us faithfully online who consider themselves a part of our extended family. I don't know of another group of people in the world 
who would have the spiritual and the mental understanding to engage in such a cause other than the people of Liberty Fellowship locally and extended. But I also know that there are tens of thousands of others across the country who are like-minded and who themselves, just like this fellow Robert that wrote me and so many others, those who are saved begging God to show them what to do and how to do it. Who knows? Ladies and gentlemen, who knows? My dear, dear friends, who knows? In the next 10 to 15 years, what God will do with the prayers and the desires of his people around the country who, like us, are praying for a revival and a restoration of truth in America and a firm repudiation of the evil doctrines of Christian Zionism and Talmudic Zionism and returning America again to its roots of truth and constitutional government natural law and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ without the works of men. I am taking the burden that the Lord has dumped on my shoulders through this letter on you. Together we need to be praying ardently for wisdom from God. By the time we finish the series explaining the eschatology of all of this and how Israel fits. It will be time to somehow, some way, take this message to people beyond that heretofore have only in their hearts prayed about it, who only in their minds have thought about it, but who do not even realize that there is a mighty army under the surface of mainstream evangelical Christianity. In the shadows of the televangelist superstars, in the caves and the dwelling places of common ordinary Christian Americans who understand the enslavement that our country is increasingly entering and who understands the source of it, who know that in order to reclaim freedom, liberty, and truth in our, in our country, we must extricate ourselves from the bondage of Zionism.
and the Judaization of the church. We must do that. We must. Not an option. It has to be done. Somehow the church has to be separated. The umbilical cord has got to be cut of this beast that has birthed a church foreign to the New Testament and doctrines of grace. We must dedicate ourselves to the gospel of Christ. Without the works of men, without the law of Moses, and the biblical, natural law, and spiritual principles of liberty. We must. We must lose our infatuation with power and prestige and political parties. Somehow or another, Christians have got to stop following these pied pipers of popularity in the evangelical churches of America today. Who cares how popular we are? Who cares how powerful we are or how prosperous we are? And who cares what political party is in charge or not? Who cares about partisan politics? It is the truth of Christ. It is the truth of genuine government. It is the truth of America's constitutional heritage that we must rediscover. And some of our brethren may have to be taken kicking and screaming in the cacophony of, of noisome resistance may come out of the traditional high steeple churches with great volume and intensity. So be it. We, I believe, in that letter, just kind of made it official in my thinking. We are on the cusp of another great Protestant Re Reformation. Except it's not just Protestant. We need a new generation of Christians to take their places on the platform of life. And I'm asking you young people to dedicate yourself right now to being a part of the solution in this problem. Studying for yourself, learning, becoming convinced and convicted about the principles of truth that God has taught and is teaching us. Determine that you will be courageous and that you will not allow yourself to be intimidated by whatever the modern circumstance might be. And for those of us that are older, we can't sit back and say, well, the young people are going to have to straighten this out. If God has another 10 or 20 years, and for some of us maybe more than that, to live, we need to dedicate every day of the rest of our lives to the proclamation of truth, trusting God to do what God alone can do. But I believe with all of my heart, listen to these letters that we're getting every week. Are you paying attention? You cannot tell me 
that God is not doing something in the hearts and the minds of millions and millions of people all over our country. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. They don't know who their friends are. They don't know where to find fellowship. They don't know how to organize. They don't know what to organize. They don't know who to organize. They don't know anything except a burning desire in their hearts that God has given them to identify truth and identify error. And in their own hearts and their own minds, they've already made up their minds. I'm going to count for truth. I am excited beyond ability to speak. These letters of late have just pierced my soul. I say to you folks, and those of you that will watch online, we have a job to do. We don't exactly know the details of what we're going to do. But I believe God's going to show us what to do. He's going to give us a plan. He's going to give us direction. And somehow, some way, we are going to connect with a vast, vast army of people who right now are disconnected from everybody else. Once we get connected, once we link arms, once we link our minds, our resources, our talents, and we begin to stand not as just a few scattered voices here and there, but when we begin to stand as a united army of men and women who are prepared to die for what they believe and are willing to face whatever the giants are that are in front of us and, spick, spick, and, and, and keep to the truth, stick to the truth, that God has given us in our hearts. When that happens, my dear friends, there's going to be a lot of people in this country who aren't going to know what hit them. Where did these people come from? People are, even the ones who don't admit it, and I'm, I'm about done. That's not a promise, it's just a suggestion. <laughs> even the people that are still standing solid behind Donald Trump, in their hearts, they know he has failed them. In their hearts, they know he was not who they thought he was and who he proclaimed to be. In their hearts, they know it's a failure. They're sticking with him because in their minds, they don't know what else to do without him. They don't know where else to turn. They don't know what the recourse would be. And so to them, it's stick with him because there just isn't anybody else around. But there is somebody else around. God hasn't gone anywhere. Amen. These are exciting days. They're more exciting than they are scary. And I know they can be scary, but they're more exciting. I can see, I believe as our founding fathers did, rays of illumining light. Liberty Fellowship, 
let's not fail the responsibility and the privilege God has given us to be in this place at this hour. And let's see what God will do. Because I'm thinking, God isn't finished with America, and God isn't finished with his church, and God isn't finished with his remnant, and God isn't finished with truth, and error has had a long time, a long time to have its way. But God always gets the last word. And just as in the ages past, when our spiritual forebears rose up at their moment in history and changed the course of the future, I believe we're living in that kind of a hour. It's exciting, folks. We're going to cut the strings of the Talmudic Zionist from the churches and from the thinking, from the philosophy, and from the politics of this country. And with God's grace, we're going to give this country a new birth of freedom. I pray that God will let me be part of it because I believe it's inevitable. And I pray that you'll come with me. And all you folks that are watching online, come with us. Let's see what God will do. Let's stand for prayer.